Hi, my name is Ruth Jenkins, and I'm really excited to be with you here this morning to discuss using improvisational theater techniques in speech language and cognitive treatment. I am a speech pathologist, and I have been a speech pathologist for 17 years now. I, my first job was working for Head Start as an SLP aide and did that for a year. And then when I finished graduate school, I worked for a year in the public school setting here in the Portland, Oregon area. After that, I was hired by the Sisters of Providence here in Portland. And I work for that facility. I started out working in the hospital as a float. So I basically did everything. I worked in rehab. I worked in outpatient. I did pediatrics whole gamut, which was a great experience for me because it really allowed me to expand my horizons and see what it was that I really wanted to do. And it also afforded me a number of opportunities to use improv with people. That's where I kind of got started with that. I had done some of it in the schools as well. In, in this realm, improv, improvisational warm-ups and activities that can be used in treatment for a variety of clinical issues, including auditory comprehension, attention and memory, pragmatic skills, word finding and word finding compensatory strategies, spelling, syntax, articulation, and fluency. Who knew? Who knew that you could address so many different things with one set of treatment activities? But you really can, as you will see in the near future here. We'll talk about the why. Why should you do this? Why should you use improv with your participants? Well, these are activities that are really engaging at the same time as being challenging and have a very definite life participation social focus. It's all about that. I believe very strongly in approaching the therapies that I do with people from that standpoint. You're, you're going to be using humor to assist in reaching out to participants and families in establishing rapport between yourself and the participants and families. And it allows rapport to be established among group members. So if you work in a group of students, or you have, for example, a TBI group, any of those kinds of groups where they need to establish rapport with each other, these kinds of activities are excellent for that. When we talk about being life-focused, to me, a big part of being life-focused is laughter. Laughter is the same in every language. We all laugh, we all need to laugh, and part of this treatment focuses on that, the ability to laugh with each other and enjoy each other socially. And so, um, you know, there are beginning to be more things in the media about laughter in the context even of dying. So, for example, there's a wonderful video out now. You can find it on YouTube. I think if you just Googled or you know, looked under YouTube for England laughter and dying, you would probably find this. Uh, it's a short documentary that was done. And the folks in it are talking about the fact that laughter has always been a big part of their life and humor in general. And when they've come to the phase where they are dying, and they're accepting that they're dying, they're not in denial of that, they find that many of their friends have backed away from them. Or if they haven't entirely backed away, when they do come to visit them, there is all this tension, and they can't break through that. And they're using humor to try to get around that. One guy has literally written jokes about what he sees as being his eventual demise, and like this whole sort of sketch comedy about how that's going to look, just so that he can help his friends to deal with his end and help himself in the same fashion. So. Just a little sidelight on the concept of laughter being valuable in treatment. Uh, the other reasons that you might choose to use this include the fact that it can provide leadership roles for participants. We'll talk about that a little bit more later, the specific ways that it does that. But one of the most overt ways that I get people to do that is by having them teach others to do it. So once they've learned some of the activities, for them to teach family members, caregivers, other students, classroom teachers, uh, anybody who is willing to participate in that, that allows them to have the socially leading role. Most of these activities do not require props, which is great. When I started working in the schools, 
I, uh, my first year out, for those of you who have worked in the school system before, you know, I was trying to be very whole language based, right? So I was making puppet theaters and masks and helping kids, like bringing in all these activities and science, you know, exploding things. I mean, we were just doing stuff all the time because I really wanted to be hands on, which is great. But I also had 72 children on my caseload and between two schools, and I was trying desperately to make this happen for all of them, and it was very, very challenging. And all of a sudden, I said, why am I not just using improv? And so I started really pulling in more of the improv games, and it worked like a charm. I could get a lot of that same stuff going without having to bring in all this stuff that took me a huge amount of time. And so uh, you know, the other part of that is it doesn't require excessive planning time, very little. Once you know that these activities, once you've explored them a few times, you'll be able to stand up and just go at it. And of course, we're giving you uh, written instructions on all of these too, so you can keep that and refer to it whenever you need it.